want to tell you a quick story about a guy named Danny Simpson. He was 24 years old. The year was 1990. He was arrested, charged, convicted, and sent to prison. I know what you're thinking. Man, what did he do? Um, The crime that he committed was robbing a bank at gunpoint for $6,000. If we were uh, to have Danny with us today, we might ask him, Danny, was it worth it? Was it worth uh, tossing away a portion of your life for $6,000? And I think Danny would say, no, no, it wasn't. Um, But what's interesting about that story is um, the gun that he used to rob the bank was a 45 caliber Colt semi-automatic. It may not mean a whole lot uh, to some of you. Um, It was made in 1918 by a company in Canada called the Ross Rifle Company. The gun that he used to rob the bank of $6,000 was valued at about $100,000. He has a $100,000 weapon in his hand that he uses illegally to steal $6,000. I think it's safe to say that he did not know what was already in his possession. And because he didn't know what was already in his possession, he was looking for something more. Does that relate to anybody? Maybe you didn't rob a bank, okay, this past week, but I think that is a lot of our lives at some point. When we lose sight of what is already in our possession, our eyes can begin to turn on outward things, and we can easily toss away a portion of our life uh, for something as measly as a few six or six thousand dollars. Today in Matthew chapter 15, we're gonna read the story of a young man who also throws away, wastes away a portion of his life for a measly inheritance. We call this story the prodigal son, but the message today we're calling the prodigal family. We've looked at the ideal family. Last week we looked at the broken family, and today we're gonna to look at the prodigal family. Family. I know that's not the common title. The common title is prodigal son, or maybe in your Bible, it says the lost son. And we give a lot of attention to the son who wandered away. But I think if we were to step back and take a fresh pass at this parable today, we would see that there really is a prodigal family. Before we begin, um, do you know what the word prodigal means? If you were to ask me that question a few weeks ago, I would have answered, well, prodigal means wayward, right? It means someone who has drifted away. They, they were raised a certain way. They were taught a certain way, but they rebelled, right? They, they lived foolishly and decided to kind of chart their own course. That's what a prodigal is, right? Because I, the only place that I've ever heard the word used is in reference to children referencing this son, the prodigal son. But as I have studied the word the last uh, couple of weeks. Prodigal doesn't mean wayward. It doesn't mean rebellious. Prodigal means this. It means wastefully or recklessly extravagant. Wastefully or recklessly extravagant. It, It means something that is over the top, okay? Something that is extreme. And so we, he is called the prodigal son because he lives this lavish and extreme and overly wasteful life. The word prodigal uh, can be used as a noun. Speaking of someone, this person's prodigal, but it can also be used as an adjective. In fact, most of the time, it's an adjective like prodigal son. But it's not just people who can be prodigal. Um, Ladies, um, if you're married, okay, and your husband likes to golf, let's just say hypothetically, okay, I'm not planting any ideas, okay, in, in in a guy's mind, but let's just say this week, your husband comes home with a brand new set of golf clubs. All right, and he spent a pretty penny on them, right? And the wife, you're like, hey, how much did you spend um, on these golf clubs? How much did these golf clubs cost us? And he tells you the price. And for you, right, you can't imagine spending a whole lot of money on these. And so you hear the number and you're like, whoa, you could say those are prodigal golf clubs. You can use it there, right? That's that's extreme, right? That is over the top. Let's kind of reverse it a little bit. Um, Husbands, if your wife comes home this week and she has just bought a purse, 
okay? I don't know what else to, uh, to use here, so we'll just kind of go with it. Let's say she buys a purse, and you ask her, honey, how much did this purse cost us? And she tells you the price. Now, for you as a guy, you can't fathom the idea of spending more than $4 on a purse. She gives you the price, and you're like, whoa, that's insane. It's over the top. That's extreme. That's a prodigal purse. And so the idea of prodigal is something that is lavish. It is extreme. It is extravagant. It is over the top. If you're with me, say I'm with you. That's a key detail as we move forward. Now, here's what I'm going to do today. Luke chapter 15, a little bit uh, different of a sermon. I'm just going to read it very slowly. Sometimes we just read an entire chunk and then kind of go back and get three points. But Today, I just want to read this passage very slowly. I want us to look at it with fresh eyes and a fresh perspective. And so we're going to take it verse by verse, and I'm going to get some commentary along the way. And my prayer is just that something that is said, the Lord would, would speak to your heart about it. Now, we are going to uh, kind of come to two points, okay? Someone say two. Two points. I know you're used to three points, you know, in a sermon. Um, if you want to tithe two-thirds today, that's totally fine. But um, only two points today, okay? I don't want you to leave, you know, the type A person going, I missed the third thing. Um, It's not here today. He also said a man had two sons. We're going to pause right there because there's a lot we got to unpack. He also said. It doesn't just start with the parable. It starts with he also said, meaning this parable follows two other parables, And all three parables in Luke chapter 15 follow a very similar pattern. The pattern is this. There is something that has extreme value and worth. That something is then lost. What is lost is then found. What is found is then celebrated. That's the pattern of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. But there are some differences between the three parables. One of the differences is uh, in the amount of things that are present with the lost thing. In the first one, there's one sheep that's lost out of 100. In the second parable, there's one coin that's lost out of 10. In the third parable, the one we're going to look at today, there's one son lost out of two. So I think we see this kind of natural progression of of greater value. This isn't just one of 100. It's not just one of of 10. This is one of two. So there's there's extreme value here with this son. Another big difference between the three parables, in the first two parables, the one who lost it actively seeks it out and searches for it. The shepherd leaves the 99, seeks out, searches for the one lost sheep. The woman who loses the coin Uh, actively turns the house upside down, throws over the couch cushions, okay, to find one lost coin. But in the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son, the father does not actively seek out the son. What does he do? He's waiting. But I want you to hear this. He's not passively waiting. He is actively waiting. He's actively waiting on his son to return. Here's what the Bible says about waiting. It says, those who wait on the Lord, here's what God will do. God will renew their strength. And so day by day, as this son is not actively seeking out, but he's actively waiting, his strength is being renewed, hoping that one day his son would return home. I just, I want to say that because if you are, um, I want to say prodigal parent, but if you are a, a parent of a prodigal, listen, you're, and you're wondering, like, what do I do? Listen, there is, there's a strength that comes when you actively wait. And so, He also said, a a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. One son asks, but both sons receive. One son says, hey, give me my share. But when he divides it up, he divides it among them. Now, um, this is not just a young kid asking for his allowance. This is not just a young kid saying, hey, dad, I want to take a one-week vacation. Can you spot me a few grand so I can go live it up? This is a young man asking for his inheritance, the very thing that he would not receive until his father passed away. 
And so effectively what this son is communicating to his dad is, dad, you're as good as dead to me. Dad, I consider you as as dead to me. I don't wanna have any part to do with you. So go ahead and give me my inheritance so I can go and live my own life and I can go and do my own thing. Now, you know what's really surprising? Is the dad actually gives it to him. The dad actually, I mean, how many of you dads would, would, would be like me? Like if I'm the dad in the story, here's what I would do. I look at my son and say, no. No way, Jose. Are you kidding me? No, you go away empty-handed. I don't think so. I'm the man of this house, right? I'm the dad. This is my stuff. It's not your stuff. But what surprises us is that this dad actually grants his request. And I think what we see in this dad is he is giving his son an incredible gift. And the gift is the freedom to fail. I, I don't think the father takes any joy in distributing these assets. I think he's doing it from a heart of brokenness over his son. But he has given his son the freedom to fail, which is exactly what God gives us. He gives us that freedom to fail. We see that play out in the garden. We are not robots, but God gives us this this freedom to choose our own way. And that's what the son does. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had and he traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. Look, the son doesn't just go to the local pub. Okay, he doesn't go to the town square. He doesn't just call all of his high school buddies. He doesn't do a little college uh, reunion. He travels to a distant country. You know what I believe? I believe he's been planning this. And the reason I believe that is because that's exactly what we do. You see, this wasn't just some random day that he walks up and goes, you know what, I think I want to go do my own thing. You know where this sin of choosing his own way came from? It started in his own heart. Listen, the Bible says that that our sin, it starts with our heart. Now, we think it's Satan, right? It's his fault. He tempted. We want to blame him. But the Bible says it originates with a desire in our heart heart. And when that desire originates, where does it move to next? It often moves to our mind, our thoughts. And we start thinking about it. You know what? That'd be really fun. That'd be really cool. And we start making preparations in our mind. And we actually start moving that desire down the field. And listen, when you think about something long enough, it eventually comes out. It eventually plays out. This is why the Bible says, guard your heart above all else, for it's the wellspring of life. This is why the Bible says that we ought to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Listen, if there's something that you are thinking about that is not of the will of God, we cannot entertain those thoughts because eventually it shows up in our behavior, in our actions, in our flesh. And so look, when he traveled to a distant country, his body was just catching up to where his mind and his heart already were. So he travels to a distant country. He squanders the estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. We have a natural disaster. There's always consequences with natural disaster. I'm not just talking about famines or earthquakes or tornadoes and hurricanes, okay? But there are accidents. There are things that happen in our life that we have no control over. But here's the deal. When we are living foolishly, when those accidents happen, the consequences are amplified. So we have natural disaster with natural consequences amplified by his own foolish prodigal living and he has nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Now, um, remember, this is a parable. Jesus is telling this story, meaning Jesus could have used any job here. He could have used any profession to make the point. He could have said, you know, they sent him into the fields to to sow seeds, to harvest crops, to plow the field, to shepherd sheep, but he doesn't. He says they sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he knew his Jewish, Jewish audience. And he knew that Jewish audience would go, ew, that is disgusting. This guy is in the very pit, right? He's at the very bottom. And that's the point that Jesus wants to make here. 
that he's at the lowest of lows. He's at the darkest of places. And it's in that darkest of places that we're about to see the light break through. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. He's at the lowest of lows. He's at the end of his rope. He's at the deepest, darkest hour of his life. And here's what's about to happen. He's about to have an epiphany. He's about to have, we call this a light bulb moment. Look at, uh, well, actually, don't. Let me, let me uh, pause here and make our first point. Two points today. Uh, first point that we can see from this son as he's sitting here with the pigs. The son can't experience the goodness of the father because he's focused on himself. The son can't experience the goodness of the father because he's focused on himself. Can we agree that his father's good? We're about to see the goodness of his father play out right before our eyes. But even if we go back to this young man's life, he had a good life. He had a good life because he had a good father. And right now he's recognizing, look, things are not good. He is not experiencing the goodness of his father. Why? Because he's been focused on himself. This young man has believed that he can find life apart from his father. I want you to see this, church. He's not running away from his home. He's not running away from his brother. He's running away from his father. He's saying, Father, you are as good to me as dead. I don't want to have anything to do with you. His eyes are focused on himself. Here's what I want. Here's what I desire. Here's what I think is best for my life. And so because he's focused on himself, he cannot experience the goodness of his father. Listen, the more focus we put on ourselves, the more miserable we become. And so this young man is in a very deep, dark, miserable place. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, this is the light bulb moment. Let me give you another word for this. This is called a revelation. A revelation is not just a book at the end of our Bible, okay, that talks about end time things. Revelation means to reveal, to be revealed. It is truth revealed. This young man is about to have a truth revealed to him. He's about to experience a revelation. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food and here I am dying of hunger? What's his revelation? He doesn't have a revelation about food. He doesn't have a revelation about hired workers. He has a revelation about his father. The revelation is, how many of my father's hired men, in my father's family, in my father's kingdom, if you will, the lowest of the low have it better than I do? He is recognizing that his father is a good father. And he is recognizing that because he had his eyes focused on himself, he stepped away and now can no longer experience the goodness of of his father, that's his revelation. And because that's his revelation and he's been running from his father, now we'll see him start to run to his father. In fact, look at verse 18. I'll get up and I'll go to my father. Listen, church, this is about the relationship between a son and a father. I will go to my father and say to him. All right, here's the deal. He's, he is preparing his speech. You ever prepared a speech? I mean, you just kind of make notes and you see how it sounds and you scratch it out. And so he is preparing speech. And I see, you know, he's right there with the pig saying, all right, pigs, how do you think this sounds? I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to say, hey, dad, I really screwed up last time. Would you, know, would you forgive me? No, that doesn't sound good. And so he, he, he prepares this speech and his speech has three points, okay? It is a good sermon. It does have three points. He says, I'll get up and I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, point number one, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Point number two, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Point number three, make me like one of your hired workers. So here's his speech. Three thoughts, right? Three sentences, three points. Number one, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight. Point number two, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. 
Point number three, make me one of your hired servants. In other words, I want to earn my spot back. I want to earn my place. And as he is moving his life in the direction back towards his father, I'm sure he's playing that speech over and over and over again. I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired men. I mean, he had this, he had this speech memorized. So he got up, verse 20, and he went to his father. He's going to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. The father moves toward the son with all of his being. Notice it says he saw him where? Not on the front porch. Not, oh, he rang the doorbell. But he saw him at a great distance. He saw him with his eyes. And after he saw him with his eyes, notice that it moved to his heart. Now he's filled with compassion. He's not bitter towards his son. He's not angry toward his son. He is relieved that his son has returned home. So from his eyes to his heart, and now his feet just take off running. Which if you read a lot of uh, commentaries, people will say that it was not dignified for a man of this stature to take off running. You know why? They would always ask others to run. A man with servants would say, hey, you take off. You go and do this. But the fact that this father ran to the son, and then when his feet get him there, his arms take over, and he embraces his son. Can Can you just feel that dad bear hug for a minute? I mean, he is just squeezing him. And now his, some people think this is awkward, okay, but we just, like, he just starts kissing him. I mean, he is kissing his son on the forehead because he is so glad that he's returned home. It reminds me of, you know, there's all the crazy of of, of childbirth, right? But but as a father, right, you, you see your child. And then your heart just, there's like this flood of emotion that just hits and you just kind of step forward and your arms embrace and you kiss your little wet, dirty baby, you know, on the forehead because you don't care, right? You're just savoring the moment of this new birth. And this father is experiencing the new birth of his son. All of him moving toward the direction of his son. Remember, the son has a speech, right? Three points. The son said to him, here it is, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. Point number two, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Wait a minute. He misses, he's missing his third point. Did he forget? Right, well, what was the third point? The third point was make me one of your hired servants, right? I wanna work this off. I wanna earn my place in your family but he never gets there. Did he forget? No. The dad cut him off. Look at verse 22. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and alive again. There's the new birth. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. He didn't forget the third point of his speech to his dad. His dad cut him off because his dad recognized, no, 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 you don't have to earn your spot back. Because of my goodness, because of my favor, because of my grace, I'm giving you your spot back. And notice how he does it. He says it puts the best robe on his son. We talked last week in the life of Joseph, the robe that he had that was given to him by, by his father. This man is given a robe, not just any robe, not just get the regular old working clothes robe, the best robe. I want you to find the most expensive robe that we have in this house, and I want you to give it to him because my son is home. So when he gives him a robe, the robe, it is a symbol of sonship. He is receiving his place. The next thing he does, he says, put a ring on his finger. Now, why does he do that? 
Maybe the father just likes bling, right? I just want my son to have some, some bling on. Um, not necessarily the ring was always a, a symbol um, of, of authority. Like a king would have a ring, a signet ring. It was his stamp of approval that was put on something. Recognizing that this letter or this message comes with the full weight and the power and the authority of the one who sends it. And so the father doesn't just say, hey, you have a place, but he says, you also have authority. So he gives him place and he gives him power. The next thing he does is he puts shoes on his feet. Put shoes on his feet. I imagine he's barefooted. I imagine he's dirty. Just like Jesus stooped down and washed the disciples' feet, just like Jesus gives the disciples purpose, just like the New Testament says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You and I have a purpose. I think the, our feet is, uh, back to Ephesians 5, uh, we put on the, the shoes of peace, right? Our, 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 our feet have a purpose. Sandals have a purpose. So God, or sorry, the Father gives his son place, gives him power, gives him purpose, and then throws a party. There's your four Ps if you want them, Okay. He throws a party. He says, my son of mine is is home. Like we have to celebrate this new birth. Now, can we just pause here and say, the way the father reacts to the son, the son brings his worst and the father brings his best. I think we could say that father's pretty extravagant. He's lavishing all of his love on this son. I think we would say, man, that's pretty extreme. That's, that's over the top. That's prodigal. We have a prodigal family. We have a, a prodigal father who is pouring all that he has on this son. It's pretty incredible. Now, the story doesn't end there. Um, the story doesn't end there. In fact, The whole reason Jesus tells all of this parable, I believe, is because of what's to come next. And I get that because if you look back at verse 2, the reason Jesus tells all three of these parables in verse 2, the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. This guy has Dairy Queen with sinners. This guy has barbecue. This guy has pool parties with sinners. And as they're looking down on sinners, they're looking up on themselves. We haven't done any of that stuff. We're the ones who are in the right. We're the ones who are righteous. And so Jesus told them this parable. And he tells them another parable. And now he tells them this parable of the lost son. Look at verse 25. Now his older brother was in the field and he came near the house and he heard music and dancing. He hears the, the sound of the party, He's, he smells the smells of the party, right? The brisket is going from this fattened calf. I mean, to, to kill the fattened calf, right? Not just a calf, like you wanted this party to last a long time. So this older son recognizes it. So he summoned one of the servants questioning what these things meant. I mean, this, this older son is pulling out his phone, looking at his um, eye calendar going, hey, I, I didn't know there was a party today. Like, whose birthday is it? Whose anniversary is it? Is there a graduation we're celebrating? Is there a holy day that I have forgotten about? Hey, what's this party all about? And notice what the servant says. He says, your brother is here, he told him. And your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And notice the brother's response. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. And so the father came out and pleaded with him, but he replied to his father, look, I have been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. That right there gives us insight into how this older brother viewed his relationship with his dad. He viewed it as a works-based relationship. He viewed it as a merit-based relationship. I do the right things, and you give the right favor. I act, that means you must respond. I've been slaving away. I've never disobeyed. Notice the eyes. And yet you never gave me a goat. What, he gets a fattened calf and I don't even get a goat? Are you kidding me? He goes on, so that I could celebrate with my friends. Do you see all the eyes and the me's and the my's of this older brother? 
But when this son of yours, he doesn't call him his brother, he says, this son of yours who has devoured your assets with prostitutes and prodigal living, if you will, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. All right, first point from the first brother was the son couldn't experience the goodness of God because he's focused on himself. Second point that we learn from the second brother is the son can't experience the goodness of God because he's focused on himself. You see that, church? These two brothers, they had the exact same problem. And their problem is they believe they can have life apart from their dad. The older brother is just as much focused on himself as the younger brother was. The only difference is the younger brother was physically distant. The older brother was physically present, but he was just as removed from his father as the younger brother was. And here's the major difference between the two. The younger son repented. The repent is to have a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of direction. And it was in his lowest of lows that he had that revelation of who his father was. And when he had the revelation of who his father was, he began to run toward his father. The older son could not have that revelation of who his father was because he thought it was completely unfair. And he could not experience the goodness of his father. Son, verse 31, he said to him, you're always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. I want to use that phrase more often in my life. Hey, it's Tuesday night. We have to celebrate. We just, like it's Thursday. It's it's Thursday at brunch, right? We got to celebrate. Everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. We're going to end right there. Look, I don't know what the Lord is specifically saying to you. I know there's probably some of you here, you, you, you kind of identify with, with the parent a little bit. You, you have a child that you are so burdened for, and you are actively waiting, hoping they'll return home at any moment. Some of you may be the first prodigal son, You have begun to run your own race. You believe that there is life apart from the Father. You started that direction. You're in the middle of that direction. Maybe you're at the end of that direction, recognizing that what you thought was out there really isn't out there. And as you have focused on yourself, and the more you focus on yourself, the more miserable you've become. And today, God wants to reveal to you His goodness. And it's through understanding his goodness that causes us to draw near to him. And there's a promise in the Bible that when we draw near to him, he draws near to us. And maybe for some in the room, you relate with the other prodigal son. The one who thought he could purchase his dad's favor with good works tell you something about the favor of God. You can't purchase it. It's too valuable. It's worth too much. How dare we not think that we could purchase it with good deeds, with coming to church, with giving money, with helping others. No, his goodness is so valuable, so worthy, so glorious, so heavenly, so miraculous that it is worth the blood of his son, Jesus. The greatest demonstration of his love is that God sent his own son to die for us, that while we were still sinners, he died for us. Would you pray with me? In this moment, this is your moment, it's your time with God. Would you ask him, Lord, what are you saying to me? 
Ask him to speak to your heart. I believe he will. Tune your heart, tune your mind, tune your thoughts. Tune your ears. God, what are you calling to us right now? There's a, there's a faith response here in this moment. We can push it, we can receive it, and we can respond in faith. God, give us the faith to follow you. And God, thank you for the work that you've done, the finished work that you've done through your son, Jesus. God, forgive us when we think that we can purchase your favor. God, you offer it to those who would repent and just simply run to you. And you don't just meet us in the middle, but God, all of you comes toward us. And that's an overwhelming thought. We are not worthy. We don't deserve it. But God, it is the reality of what you have said to be true. And so we receive it. God, move through each and every heart, young and old, today. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen.